What do you know about wound healing? What are the cells involved in wound healing? What are the phases of wound healing? What are all those growth factors? We're gonna crush this today at Citizen Surgeon. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm totally pumped that you're here today to join us for this talk on wound healing. My goal is to scale surgical education and get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, and of course to crush those exams. If you haven't had a chance yet to hit the subscribe button, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications, then you'll be the first to hear when these videos come out. I also want to put a plug in for citizensurgeon.com. You can check this out. You can sign up for the blog where I, where I talk about everything inside and outside of the operating room. There's also some great resources there for review. And of course, all the videos are available as well. You can also sign up for the Saturday 6 newsletter. That's where I put out six things that have totally inspired me or got me thinking this week. And uh, also, you can join the community. And that's where the groups of uh, students and trainees are there to engage. And so I'd be super pumped if you joined us. All right, citizensurgeon.com. Now, let's get into wound healing. So the reference today is Surgery, Basic Science and Clinical Evidence. I think this is an awesome book when it comes to these basic science subjects. It's heavy, but it includes all the information I think you need to be responsible for and a little bit more. You can find a link to it in the description below, and I also talked about it in my video on my favorite books in surgery. So why do we need to know about wound healing? Well, you're a surgeon, or you're gonna be a surgeon, or you're interested in surgery, and surgeons make wounds, and we take care of wounds. So if you're gonna be making wounds, you should really know the processes behind why a wound heals, how it heals, and then how you might be able to either help a wound heal or what you can do to avoid poor wound healing. So let's get into it. When we think about wound healing, it's best to think about it with these three things in mind. First is the phases. There are three phases of wound healing we're gonna talk about. Second are the cells. In each phase of wound healing, there is a predominant cell type. We're gonna talk about that. And then three are the events. So everything from vasoconstriction to stop the bleeding after that initial injury to the elaboration of growth factors and setting down that collagen matrix. All these are events throughout the wound healing process. We're gonna cover them all today. All right, first, the phases. So you can see here that I have a timeline and I've set this timeline up so you can think about when these phases start and when they transition into that next phase. So it's set up at time of injury, three days, seven days, three weeks, and months to years. And so first let's think about the phases. So there are three phases and they overlap and we're gonna talk about these in detail, but first is that inflammatory phase. So the inflammatory phase kicks off right after injury and it lasts for about a week. All right. Overlapping with this around day three, day two to three, is what's called the proliferative phase. And that goes for a few weeks. And that extends and it overlaps with what's called the remodeling phase. And that can last for up to a two years as that scar matures. So what cells are involved in each of these phases? So you can see here in the different cells at each, at each time point, that initially, right after injury, first you get those platelets that are coming, but the predominant cell type in the inflammatory phase is the neutrophil. As we're gonna talk about, the neutrophil scavenges debris, gets rid of all the nasty stuff, and is responsible for sterilizing the wound. Around day two to three, you're gonna have monocytes come into the wound. They're gonna elaborate a bunch of different growth factors that we're gonna talk about. And this overlaps with fibroblasts a little bit later in that first week. And in each phase, you have these predominant cell types. So in the inflammatory phase, you have the neutrophil. In the proliferative phase, you have the monocyte. And in the remodeling phase, you have the fibroblasts, and that's where you get that collagen deposition and that maturation of the wound. All right, let's get into the inflammatory phase. 
So boom, let's say you're on the trauma service and you get this guy that came in after this motor vehicle accident and he has this big laceration on his knee. Everything's going all right, but he has this big lack on his knee. So what's happening within the wound in the inflammatory phase? So after this injury, first you're gonna get intense vasoconstriction. And if you haven't checked out that video on bleeding and be comfortable with primary hemostasis, the complement cascade and all those coagulation cascades, definitely check that out in the link above. But for here, what happens is you get vasoconstriction, you get exposure of this subendothelial matrix, and that causes platelet aggregation and formation of that platelet ply. And that's gonna be your primary hemostasis. Now primary hemostasis is that Kickstarter for wound healing, and I'm gonna show you why. Primary hemostasis is the beginning of repair. And so what is it about primary hemostasis that leads to repair? Well, first is you get bradykinin. So bradykinin is gonna be elaborated. And what's that gonna do? That's gonna vasodilate. Now you have your primary hemostasis, you have control of your bleeding, this is gonna to start to dilate those blood vessels and capillaries so you can start to get these neutrophils into the wound. The other thing that it's gonna do is it's in gonna increase your vascular permeability. So those neutrophils, monocytes, can get out of the bloodstream and into those injured tissues. Also, the complement cascades. So in that lecture on coagulation cascades, we talked about complement. So factors C3A and C5A, these are factors that are gonna not only be chemoattractants, but they're also gonna increase vascular permeability even more. And finally, histamines secreted from your mast cells and your leukotrienes, these are gonna break cell-to-cell -cell contact in the endothelium and really allow those neutrophils and monocytes to get into the wound. So there are a lot of things that are happening these don't happen in sequence, they're basically happening all together. But think about bradykinin, your complement C3A, C5A, as well as histamine leukotrienes as being some really important mediators to vasodilating and increasing vascular permeability so those inflammatory cells like neutrophils and monocytes can get in the wound and start to do their job. So neutrophils, you gotta love the neutrophils. So this is the most important cell in the first 24 hours of an injury and a wound. Well, why is that? Well, neutrophils are the cell that's responsible for sterilizing the wound. Neutrophils are scavengers, so they're gonna get rid of debris. They're gonna get rid of bacteria. They're even gonna get rid of foreign bodies. So they're really important in that first 24 hours for cleaning up the wound. So what happens next? Well next, right around 48 to 72 hours, you get your monocytes, both that are coming in from the local environment and also monocytes that have been attracted from those chemoattractants like the complement factors, C3A, C5A. And they're coming in and they're gonna come into the wound and the monocytes are gonna become macrophages and these are the primary regulator of wound healing and they're the primary cell type or the predominant cell type at 48 to 72 hours. Now you ask yourself, or I ask myself, well, so why are these the primary regulator of wound healing? Well, the reason is, is because macrophages secrete a ton of growth factors. Everything from TGF beta and TGF alpha, which we're gonna talk about, platelet-derived growth factor, uh, EGF, fibroblast growth factor, uh, VEGF, all of these are secreted by the macrophage. And so the macrophage is really responsible for elaborating these growth factors so they can get the fibroblasts into that wound and start to lay down some collagen. We're gonna talk about that. So why else? So from a surgeon's point of view, what's a good example of why it's important to know that the macrophages are predominant at 48 to 72 hours? Well, if you ever have heard of something called delayed primary closure, this is an excellent relay or an excellent tie into the basic science and why you gotta know the basic science of wound healing. So in delayed primary closure, let's say that you have a really sick patient who's septic. You open up their belly and you find that they have 
diffuse peritonitis, maybe they have stool or fecal and debris all over the abdomen. You go ahead and you maybe, you, it's diverticulitis, so you do a sigmoid colectomy, you bring out an endostomy, it's a dirty wound, class four wound, and so you decide that I need to close the fascia, but I'm gonna leave this wound open. Well, when's the best time to close that wound? So delayed primary closure is when you don't close the wound right at the time of surgery. You also don't let the wound heal by secondary intention. That would be if you left the wound edges open and you allow granulation tissue to fill the wound. But what you do is you do a primary closure after a few days. And the optimal timing is between 48 and 72 hours when the neutrophils have sterilized the wound, gotten rid of all the debris, and the macrophages are predominant. And we find that if you do a DPC or a delayed primary closure at 48 to 72 hours, you can have really good outcomes with decreased surgical site infections. So that's a great tie-in and why it's important to know the basic science of wound healing. All right, what's next? So next is transitioning from this inflammatory phase to the proliferative phase. And what is the marker of the proliferative phase? Well, the marker of the proliferative phase is collagen deposition and the formation of that collagen matrix, as well as fibroblast proliferation. So when we get into the proliferative phase, the fibroblast becomes the predominant cell type between days three and five. And the function of the fibroblast is to lay down collagen and heal this wound. So how do fibroblasts work? So you can see here, and I got a little cartoon going, and you can go back to that lecture on primary hemostasis where we talk about laying down of that hemostatic plug or that platelet plug, and you get this matrix of fibrin and fibrinogen. Well, the fibroblasts use this when they start to migrate to the wound because of those macrophages, they use this as a scaffold to start to lay down this collagen and extracellular matrix. Now you can see that in the extracellular matrix I have here, that's composed of fibrin, fibrinogen, macrophages, platelets, and glycosaminoglycans. And the most predominant one here is hyaluronic acid, and I have it as HA. Now that is a molecule that absorbs a ton of water, so it's like a sponge, and fibroblasts can use all of these together as a scaffold for starting to lay down the collagen. Now laying down the collagen and having fibroblasts proliferate is a really complex process. The formation of this ECM or extracellular matrix is dependent on not only the cells, not only the macrophages and the fibroblasts, but it's also dependent on integrins and membrane receptors within the extracellular matrix. So it's a complex process, but this gives you kind of a simplified version and who the major players are. So when the fibroblasts start laying down collagen, what is collagen and what are the different types? And so here, there are more than 27 types of collagen. Now they all have a right-handed triple helix. Maybe that would come useful in an exam. And all of the different types have to do, they're differentiated by changes in that triple helix. Maybe a bend here or a bend there will be the difference between type three collagen and type one collagen. Now the reason I brought up type three and type one collagen is type one collagen is the most, it's the predominant collagen in the skin, both in unwounded skin and in wounded skin. But in the early phases of wound healing, type three collagen is very high. A good way to think about the ratio of type one to type three collagen is that there is four times as much type one collagen as there is type three collagen in skin and wound scar. Now, even though there is relatively increased amount of type three collagen early in the healing process, it's always less than the total amount of type one collagen in the mature scar. So after a couple of weeks in the proliferative phase, laying down that collagen, we get into the remodeling phase. So the remodeling phase takes into action or goes into action between two and three weeks in a wound. And this is where you get 
further collagen cross-linking, regression of the capillaries, so that's when the wound becomes less pink, okay, because the capillaries are starting to regress, and you get maturation of the scar, which can take up to a couple of years. Now, there are a bunch of enzymes involved in this process, and they can be the collagenases or gelatinases or the matrix metalloproteinases or MMPs. Now, it's important that you don't need to remember all those, but just know that there are a lot of different enzymes responsible for that collagen cross-linking, transitioning from type 3 to type 1 collagen, and of course, regressing those capillaries and maturing the scar. And in this cartoon, you can see a progression of a wound. So you take that first wound that maybe somebody had a lack repair or that knee that we saw, and you repaired that laceration, and you see that you have bruising, some ecchymosis around the wound. And then after you take the sutures out, maybe around day seven, you see that the wound is still really red. That's because maybe bradykine or some of these other vasodilators are still within the wound bed and they're causing those capillaries to engorge. But after time, these capillaries go away, they regress during the remodeling phase, and then you can be left with this thin, pale scar. Now we can ask the question, what is scar? What's the difference between normal skin and scar? Well, scar is where you have disorganized collagen deposition and also disorganized tissue architecture compared to the skin around it. So finally, in the remodeling phase, one thing to remember, and this is frequently tested on your exams, is tensile strength. So at different stages in the wound healing process, the wound is gonna gain strength. Now you can see in this graph that the increase in tensile strength is quite rapid in the first few days of a healing wound, but it's still very low as a percentage of the strength or the tensile strength in normal skin. And even after waiting six to eight weeks, you see that a scar is only going to heal up to 80% of the strength of normal skin. So it will never be the same. Now this graph gives you an idea of how the tensile strength progresses over these stages of wound healing. Now in the next couple of slides, I want to go over a few of the really important growth factors that you should know. And we're going to break them down into what the growth factor is, what the cells are responsible for secreting it, and of course, what the function of that growth factor is. So I'm gonna get out of the way. And so on this slide, I have two growth factors. I have platelet-derived growth factor and transforming growth factor beta. So platelet-derived growth factor, or PDGF, is secreted by alpha granules in the platelets, and in addition, macrophages, endothelial cells, and fibroblasts. So what does PDGF do? It is a chemoattractant, so it attracts neutrophils, macrophages, and fibroblasts to the wound. It also stimulates fibroblasts to synthesize new extracellular matrix. It also increases the collagenase enzyme, which we just learned is responsible or is active in the remodeling process. So how about TGF-beta, transforming growth factor beta? So this is secreted by platelets, macrophages, fibroblasts and keratinocytes. You can see that there's a pattern here with platelets, fibroblasts, and macrophages being really important in the wound healing process. And what does TGF-beta do? It stimulates collagen synthesis and decreased extracellular matrix degradation. It also attracts fibroblasts and macrophages to the wound. So it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy. You get TGF-beta that's secreted by macrophages and fibroblasts, and that attracts more macrophages and fibroblasts into the wound. And we've learned that in the inflammatory phase, once the neutrophils are done cleaning up the wound, the macrophages are the predominant cell type. And then, of course, when we get into the proliferative phase, the fibroblasts take over and start laying down that collagen. So let's go to a couple more growth factors. Just two left. So fibroblast growth factor, that's another important one. This is secreted by endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and macrophages, and this stimulates endothelial cells to divide and form new capillaries. Wounds need blood to heal, and this is also why wounds are a little bit red or pink. And so FGF stimulates the formation of these new capillaries, and another growth factor really responsible for this angiogenesis or formation of blood vessels is called VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor. 
This is secreted by platelets, macrophages, fibroblasts, and keratinocytes, and this leads to increased expression in hypoxia. It's, and also stimulates the proliferation of endothelial cells for angiogenesis. So another really important growth factor, and both of these are involved in increasing the blood supply to get that wound healed. All right, just to recap, we got wound healing. We have three phases, inflammatory, proliferative, remodeling. We have three major cell types, neutrophils, macrophages, fibroblasts, and we have different events, formation of that platelet plug, elaboration of a bunch of growth factors, and deposition of collagen. I tried to make this really simple today. It can get super complex, but these are definitely the highlights that you should know as a medical student interested in surgery or a surgical resident sitting for your exams and thinking about wound healing on the ward. All right, here's a summary slide ties all this together. So, like we said, three phases of wound healing, inflammatory, proliferative, remodeling. Each phase has distinct cell types like we talked about. Remember that the wound tensile strength is only gonna reach 75 to 80% of normal unwounded tissue, and there are a lot of growth factors involved, and I gave you a few to remember. So I hope you enjoyed that talk on wound healing. This is a critical subject. A lot of these concepts are examined over and over again, whether that's the USMLE or the abside, or of course the board exams. Again, if you like this, go ahead, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Also check out citizensurgeon.com. I'm trying to build a good community of surgeons and surgically minded people who want to help scale education and get everybody comfortable with these topics. If you want me to talk about a certain topic, go ahead, leave a comment down below. I love to engage with you guys. Gets me super pumped and keeps me motivated to keep producing these videos. All right, take care, peace out.